welcome to What's Next Virginia. I know many of you are in Tennessee, but this is done as a courtesy to Fred Bissinger of Wimberley Lawson, who is a college roommate of mine, and his good friend Luther Wright, who is who's going to take over from here while we get Fred to rejoin the, the broadcast. Go ahead, Luther. Thanks, and I want to thank everybody for being uh, a part of this process today. Uh, Fred, who you were here from in uh, just a minute, uh, and I have been practicing lawyers in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, for the better part of uh, the past 25 years. Uh, and we have uh, created a relationship with one another where we're able to have uh, open and honest uh, dialogues about race, and particularly, probably about five-ish years ago, we started having a conversation uh, around some of the themes uh, that we'll talk about today uh, regarding uh, best practices for dealing with uh, race-related workplace discussions. Uh, and certainly in light of the things that we've seen going on in the last several months, uh, this uh, conversation is timely. Fred, I think I just saw you chime in via phone. That is correct. I'm on the phone. I don't know what happened to my internet, but I'm live at least via phone. <laughs> so we can at least uh, I hear you. So I was starting with the introduction of the topic and, and talking about how you and I started having these conversations probably, what, at least five years ago, uh, just as we were presenting uh, at various conferences with each other uh, and started to have really good dialogue. And then I guess it was a month or so ago, uh, we started uh, doing this type of presentation together, you know, emphasizing those things that are important for employers to know, uh, but also uh, able to examine uh, some of the differences that we have uh, in terms of how we process this information. Uh, and it's a good conversation uh, for us to have. So that's the genesis of, of, of sort of how we put this presentation together and started having that conversation. Uh, Fred, do you want to pick up from there? Yeah, I think the, the primary focus that uh, Luther and I want to present today is that, you know, th this is a very, very difficult issue uh, at, on any level. Okay, talking about race has always been a very difficult issue in our country. And uh, given current events, uh, Luther and I felt very strongly that this is an issue that, at least from an employment law perspective, it is one that we wanted to help our employer base uh, you know, work on because if you sit and wait for the issue to come and present itself to you, you know, you're going to have a big, big problem on your hands. And instead, we want to encourage people to be proactive and, and to feel comfortable taking the initiative, you know, dealing with an uncomfortable talk, topic and addressing it, the issue of race proactively in the workplace. So that's what this session is, is designed for. Luther, I'll hand it back over to you. If I can, real quick, the y'all have had a very easy time of having this conversation between you two, and it's sort of how this this presentation evolved and how you all work so closely together. I guess what it is about yourselves and each other, very quickly, if you can, for the audience, what it is about you and your relationship that's easier to have this conversation than you think others do. Uh, I would start off with, we have a lot of similarities, both in ed educationally speaking, as well as that we both have spent well over 20 years uh, working with employers, trying to help them deal with employee related issues. So from those perspectives, we have a very common view of the world. And, and an additional point is that as lawyers, we're always trained to look for the other side of the argument and we're trained not to think in sort of uni a unidimensional world. And so we're comfortable doing, well, what if this, or what if that? Well, I don't like this, or I don't like that. And so from those perspectives, we have a lot of similarities, despite the fact that we come from very different worlds. We're obviously, you know, different races. Um, but I, I think those would be the primary factors from my analysis uh, that help us talk about the matter in, in a respectful manner, despite our dis disagreements. Yeah, and, and I agree with everything that Fred said, but what I would add is this, and this is something that I share anytime I have an opportunity to talk about unconscious bias. We built a relationship that was based on friendship before we started having those difficult conversations. So it wasn't just, you know, out of the gate, hey, let's talk about race in the workplace. It was, hey, let's talk about our practices. We kind of hang out. We get to know each other. We realize that we have a lot in common. 
Uh, and then we were able to, to go into some of those more difficult topics. What I've seen happen in a lot of workplaces uh, is folks start to have these conversations with people that they don't already have a good relationship with. And it's sort of the, you know, the introduction is uh, confrontational. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the subject matter is. Uh, if your first real meaningful conversation with someone uh, is about something that's hard to talk about, it's probably not going to go well, uh, even if you all are very similar. Uh, so my advice is always to, to sort of mimic, you know, what Fred and I did. We got to know each other. Say, hey, this is a cool guy. We got a lot in common. Now let's talk about and explore some things uh, that we may feel differently about. But it was, it was premised on the fact that we had a good relationship. That's a very important perspective as people go into this, this, I think, accelerated conversation. We're sort of catching up, and it's difficult to get relationships caught up to absorb and have that kind of positive interaction. So go ahead and uh, jump into your presentation here, and uh, I'll get out of your way. I wanted to make sure that people understand. I think, Fred, you've got to make one of your, either the computer or the phone. <laughs> but, so... You know, everybody on the line and uh, several of you have asked some really good questions uh, as you were signing up that we'll address as part of this conversation. Uh, but you all know that uh, our issues surrounding race, particularly in the workplace, go back a number of years. And as employers, uh, our duties and responsibilities really began uh, with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was designed to eradicate uh, discrimination and harassment in the workplace uh, based on those classic protected classes of race and sex and religion and national origin. And then, of course, in the latter years, uh, well, at least uh, originally in the 1968 time frame, age was added uh, to uh, the paradigm. Uh, and then we've also added over the years other categories, disability, uh, pregnancy. Uh, and as recently as a couple of weeks ago, you know, the United States Supreme Court is still uh, trying to really uh, quantify, qualify, give us guidance on how our responsibilities uh, relate to this statute, even most recently now, uh, making certain that issues like uh, sexual orientation uh, and uh, transgender status are included in this conversation about sex and harassment and discrimination. Uh, we know that these things persist uh, despite our best efforts uh, in our workplaces. Uh, and we know uh, that those issues have been made even more complicated uh, by the recent events that we've seen in the news related to the uh, death of George Floyd uh, and the surrounding protests, controversies, conversations uh, that have been bubbling under the surface for a long time about the Confederate flag or uh, statutes and things of that nature. Uh, and so what we have to do and what Fred and I uh, always talk about uh, is sort of squaring our legal responsibilities with the realities of what we see going on uh, with recent events and trying to figure out uh, a way to make sure that our workplaces are protected. But at the same time, uh, we're also uh, doing a great service to our employees uh, so that those issues that are going on uh, in society at large are not taking over and dominating our workplaces. Hey Luther, let me jump in. One, one point in something you and I were just talking about last week is that one of the dynamics that is interesting, and it's not necessarily a positive dynamic, is that when you look at the, the concept behind the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the idea was that, at, at least in the employment setting, employers were tasked with, with the uh, requirement to evaluate employees, candidates, employees, based on the merits of who they are, their skills, training, education, performance, et cetera, and not to evaluate people based upon one or more uh, boxes they might check, male, female, old, young, disabled, not disabled, white, black, blah, 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 right? And, and one of the things that you know, I've seen cropping up in, in the discussions that have uh, happened since George Floyd, uh, the, that scenario occurred, is, is a lot of talk about evaluating people based on what group they are. You're black or you're not black. And, and that is a problematic paradigm in my perspective. That's part of the discussion we're going to have today, because ultimately, when you get sued, 
uh, because an employee or an applicant who wasn't hired you know, says that they were discriminated against based on some protected category, the EEOC and, and the plaintiff's lawyer are going to be asking you all sorts of questions about how did you evaluate this employee as an individual, not, oh, were you being socially active and trying to you know, give them more favorable status or evaluate them differently in some form or fashion because they check certain protected characteristic boxes? Now, I think you're right. And so, you know, friend, from my perspective, where this conversation really starts uh, is by us examining some of those barriers that we've historically had uh, to having conversations uh, around these topics. Because even what you just raised, you know, as an example, folks find it hard uh, to sort of process, well, why does this person believe that they've been treated in some inappropriate fashion? You know, surely uh, as an employer, someone who uh, has a great reputation in the community, I wouldn't treat anybody that way. Uh, and it's hard for us to have a conversation uh, around some of those topics. So there uh, are a couple of barriers uh, that I want to address. And Fred, feel free to jump in. Because uh, these are the things that I think prevent us from having healthy conversations uh, about uh, race and other protected categories from time to time. Um, Invalidation of perspectives, and we're going to walk through each one of these, but I want to tick them off for you. And if you have the slide uh, deck, you can follow along. Invalidation of perspectives, stereotyping, uh, bias, particularly unconscious bias, uh, racial isolation, uh, and fear. Let me jump into uh, the first category, and that is the validation, uh, the invalidation of perspectives. Uh, and, and what I see a lot in my practice, particularly when I'm training, uh, is that we have a failure to appreciate the full range of and differences in racial experiences. And a lot of that drives the perception, right? We're not accustomed to having those conversations or even being able to see an issue from someone else's perspective. And when I say invalidation of perspectives, I mean on either side uh, of the conversation. Uh, and, and one of the things that I've noted a lot uh, is that our experiences and perspectives have been so different based on the lives that we live, the communities that we've come from, uh, the bad and good experiences that we had, that we tend to totally invalidate and discount the experiences of someone else. Uh, and we're very dismissive often, right? Uh, if you want to be treated respectfully, we get into this conversation about political correctness, or if you believe uh, that you've been mistreated, regardless of who you are, right? You're paranoid uh, or you're overly sensitive. Uh, and when we discount that perspective and we don't give any validity to it, it makes it hard for us to even have a conversation about it because we've discounted the perspective before we ever really sat down and had that conversation. Luther, you know, uh, in terms of cases that we've worked over the years, you know, if we have a case in which there was an event that occurred, let's just say on a manufacturing floor, you know, we were taught as young lawyers, rule number one, go and walk that manufacturing floor and go to the accident site and evaluate it, spend time there, talk to the people there, because that's how you understand it. Well, that, that analogy is 100% true to the point that you're making. You know, when you're dealing with a, an issue as an employer, a race-related issue of some variety, it's easy to sit in a management chair and say, well, that's not who we are. That kind of stuff doesn't happen in this workplace. However, you need to be, you know, be able to look at the other side of the equation, put yourself in that, that you know, rank-and-file employee's shoes and try to go and, and see who it is, where they work, who they work with what it is that they do, and maybe get a, a glimpse into their world so you can understand the perspective they bring. It doesn't mean that they have necessarily a valid claim of race harassment or discrimination. It just means that you can actually evaluate it uh, from a factual standpoint and not from a theoretical, personal, personally biased viewpoint. Because what we see nowadays, especially on social media, this issue, Luther, of invalidating perspectives, it's one of the biggest cancers we have that prohibits and inhibits our ability to have honest and thoughtful discussions on any difficult issue. Yeah, and, and I'll give you a good example. And I think, uh, Fred, we did this presentation several uh, 
it seems like years ago, but it was not too long ago, <laughs> you know, and I talked about, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, we had a, a conversation on uh, Facebook about the Confederate flag. He is from the South. Uh, the flag means a lot to him. Uh, it meant a lot to his granddaddy. It meant a lot to his dad. Uh, he and I have been uh, good friends for the better part of 30 years. And this guy's never ever uttered anything that you would even begin to think uh, was racially motivated or derogatory at all. And so we were going back and forth and he said, Hey, I, I don't get it. You know, this is just Southern pride and I love this flag and this meant a lot to my family. Well, I said, look, I get that. And I'm not invalidating your perspective at all, but my experience has been completely different, right? My family's from Pulaski, Tennessee the birth of the uh, the home place and the birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan. Our experience with the flag used as a piece of intimidation is completely different. Now, it doesn't invalidate his perspective, and, and, and my perspective is certainly valid. But like I told him, we can agree to disagree, but I want you to understand that that's the perspective that I have. And in the same fashion uh, that you're expressing your perspective, I want you to consider my perspective as well. We feel differently about it. Our experiences are totally different. My grandfather and father did not embrace the Confederate flag because it was used to intimidate them and was usually associated uh, with some act of racial violence or intimidation. So of course our perspectives are different. Doesn't mean that one is valid and one is invalid. It means we have completely different experiences. And if we're gonna work together, we need to understand that. Well, Luther, how many times have you had this scenario come up? where you you are able to work with one of your clients and your client actually sits down with an employee and listens to their point of view regardless of whether they agree with it or not the fact that the the mere act of listening and considering somebody's input at the end of that conversation when the employer says listen bob i've heard what you had to say i appreciate you being candid with me I, i'm trying to wrap my brain around what it is you're telling me but ultimately I, I disagree that you know this event, whatever it was, was somehow the result of discrimination. Instead, I think it was more of a personal conflict, misunderstanding, whatever. And then that employee says, okay, I, I, I got it, boss, and they walk away. They don't necessarily agree with the decision, but they respect that supervisor or manager for actually listening and considering their point of view and are willing to move past it because they were heard and their, their perspective was not invalidated as, as you mentioned. So at this point, I think you're spot on. Yeah, and, and, and I think your example uh, is great. And I see that happen a lot of times. It's like, look, just hear me out. You may not agree with me, but at least respect my perspective enough to hear me out, You know, which is what my friend and I both did. And, and we had a great conversation about it. He's like, hey, I never considered it from that perspective, but I see what you're saying. Please know that my perspective is different. And like I said, we respectfully agree to disagree uh, instead of getting bogged down in the you're stupid, you're racist, you're overly sensitive. And a lot of times those conversations devolve in that fashion. Uh, and that's why I always start with that one, because if we can just wrap our minds around giving validity to different experiences and perspectives, uh, we're probably 80 percent of the way to having a better conversation. Great. Let's move on because we're going to lose track of time here. Yeah, yeah, we're going to uh, speed through the rest of them because I want you guys to digest them. Uh, but I want you to think about stereotypes. Uh, one of the things that I say to folks all the time, whenever you put people in a box and you start treating them based on what you expect them to be instead of what they are, you're going down the wrong path and you're going to end up in one of those places uh, where you're having uh, negative conversations in the workplace. Uh, one of the things that I do a lot, because I do a lot of training uh, in the Midwest, uh, and I usually stand up. I've typically got a suit on, and I'll say, how many of you guys think, you know, that I grew, grew up on a farm uh, or currently live on a farm? We got uh, 30 cows grazing uh, 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 on our land, and people start laughing. It's like, you're a black dude from the South, and you're the, uh, an attorney. And I'm like, yeah, and I also live on a farm, right? Stop stereotyping people. Don't put them in a box based on your past experiences. If you want to have healthy conversations cross-culturally, uh, the first thing that you have to do is treat everybody like an individual. And that goes to the point I was raising earlier about it seems like a lot of the conversation going on now is automatically kind of going in the reverse order of analyzing people individually and going back to your, your part of group X and therefore you are A, B, and C. 
Yeah, you're exactly right. And our experiences in the media are, are showing us uh, that that's not necessarily the case uh, in that we put ourselves in a box when we do that. Uh, a related concept to stereotypes is uh, bias. Uh, if you're following along with the slides, you know, we talk about these concepts of implicit and explicit bias. Uh, and because of time, we're not gonna dig deeply into those issues, but I always encourage folks to really do a self-examination and try to figure out if some of your implicit biases are showing up in the workplace. You know, our explicit biases uh, are easy to recognize uh, because they're usually at the forefront and they're conscious. Uh, our implicit biases are, are the ones that uh, we have to do some self-discovery on uh, to figure out how we're being impacted. Uh, and, and I'll give you a, a real quick example of some implicit biases uh, that you have to face. One, one of the things that I talk about a lot in this space is the, the reality, Fred, that I'm a child of divorce. And when I came into the workforce, uh, without thinking about it, I tended to gravitate towards single moms. And if you were a divorced guy and had another child like my dad did, uh, I didn't trust you. And, and those are some of those things that as you really start to look at how your conversations are playing out, you have to think about whether or not some of those biases that you're not even conscious of are impacting you in the workplace. Do you have some past bad racial experiences that are defining what has happened to you, right? You had a bad experience in high school or you had a bad experience in a relationship and now some of those lingering feelings and emotions manifest themselves as to how you treat people who remind you of those circumstances or those individuals. So we gotta address that implicit bias. Uh, we gotta make sure that we understand that we all have them uh, and they all play out in different ways and we have to be honest about the biases uh, that we have because that's the only way we can make sure uh, they're not impacting us in the workplace. Let me jump in on that one just very quickly. And that's why you, you've heard me talk about this before, Luther, is that you know, when you look at your three primary employee evaluation metrics, attendance, performance, behavior, right? the idea is to create as many objectively quantifiable metrics associated with each of those three primary metrics so that, so that the ultimate evaluation of somebody is not or it, look, they're going, there's going to be subjective criteria involved in that analysis, but most of it should be di driven by objective criteria, and that will help to some extent weed out the, the, that implicit bias that people might not be aware of. And so again, for, for many uh, of our uh, employers on the line, they have different objectively quantifiable metrics that they can apply, and I just encourage people to really use those objectively quantifiable metrics in your analysis of employees and this is one, this is one of many reasons why they're very helpful. Yeah, another point that I think uh, that we need to overcome as a barrier uh, is the fact that for the vast majority of our employees, and, and, and hear me carefully here, there are always exceptions uh, to uh, what I'm about to say, but for many of us in the workforce, uh, we have had and continue to have very racially isolated experiences. Our social circles are not uh, integrated. Uh, we've not had meaningful interactions. Uh, a lot of times folks have attended uh, segregated schools, uh, or even if they weren't segregated, uh, they self-segregated within those experiences, uh, which then feeds on this idea that a lot of times the most meaningful interaction that people of different races are having is in the workplace. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much tension. There are folks that are not accustomed to having close relationships, meaningful relationships, those discussions as we alluded to earlier, right? Fred and I spent a lot of time together before we started talking about these issues and we didn't just have a limited sort of social circle and then start talking about something that might be controversial and very emotional. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, and I say this all the time and I say it respectfully, uh, we suck at having these conversations cross-culturally uh, because we've not necessarily had those experiences and things from uh, not only the words that we speak, but sometimes our body language even reinforces a lack of comfortability uh, with people who are different from us. Uh, and we have to really, again, be self-critical 
and say, hey, am I stiffening up when I see somebody of a different race because I'm uncomfortable with this conversation? Uh, are my words betraying me? Am I giving looks to people uh, that would suggest that uh, I'm uncomfortable with them or I'm suspicious of them? And one of the things that we have to do to sort of combat this is to make sure that we're creating those quality experiences where we can combat some of the racial isolation that most of us have experienced uh, and may still be experiencing uh, in our social circles. I'm with you on that. And let, uh, I think fear kind of lines up with that one um, pretty much the same, the same way. And as I mentioned to you last time, my, my, one of my assistants is my age, black female who's been in Tennessee for a couple of years, came from Chicago. And she told me in reviewing this presentation, she said she, without me even saying it, this issue of people being afraid to have a meaningful conversation because in today's world they're afraid they're going to be branded a racist for holding a different point of view is one of the, if not it's probably the most uh significant impediment to having any sort of meaningful conversation and the more i thought about this issue the more i think she's right that that, that people are just afraid because it, in today's world it's a gotcha game you say something wrong next thing on social media you know your end as an as some sort of beast. and it's really discouraging but that's why that's why, again, we're encouraging the attendees, don't be afraid of that. Be, be willing to have a, these difficult conversations because in the long run, they're gonna do you uh, you know, a, a good service if you're thoughtful and honest in how you approach them. Yeah, and the other you know, items that we talked about on that same slide with fear, uh, the fear of being misunderstood or having a conversation that becomes emotional uh, in some way and it becomes very heated. Uh, and then this conversation, uh, comes back to haunt you. In, in my experience, you know, the fear and the invalidation of perspectives kind of go hand in hand, which is why they book me in this conversation. Because if we feel like, hey, whatever I have to contribute to this conversation is going to be deemed invalid before I even start having the conversation, uh, then that's going to reinforce this fear of being misunderstood or getting overly heated. And what happens a lot of times in my experience uh, is people will not speak up or address issues the first time or in the early stages. And by the time we started having those conversations in the workplace now, they really started to uh, explode uh, because it wasn't the first time. Now this was the 18th time that something like this has happened. And instead of having a thoughtful conversation, we're having a much more heated conversation. And if we're not careful, that fear and that tendency to invalidate the communications from one another will create this powder keg effect. And because we couldn't have those respectful conversations in the initial stages, all of our conversations end up being incredibly heated and happen after many situations. So this is something we got to get our handle on. We got to become a lot more comfortable having those conversations uh, in the early stages before uh, they come back to bite us in the backside. Yeah, Lou, that's a perfect segue into to slide 17. And, and I will just tag on to your point there. Um, how many times in your years of practice did you have a sex harassment case that you either were handling on behalf of the employer or that you were investigating as a third party? And, and you talk to the female who's made the allegations and they're bringing the allegations forward like a year and a half after the bad behavior started. And it's like the 18th iteration of the bad behavior before they finally say something. I mean, so I, from a practical perspective, your point is well taken in that on these issues of race and sex, it's sort of like death by a thousand slices most times. So that segueing into slide 17, for those of you on the line, look, if you want to, to deal with this issue effectively, um, nobody's going to get it right. Every workplace is different. Your demographics are different. But the number one, the number one factor in, in my personal perspective that will help you succeed is not being afraid to be a leader, whether you're the CEO, but it's really important to have people in the C-suite who are willing to stand up and, and state, you know, this is who we are. This is what we expect. This is what we will uh, tolerate. And this is what we won't tolerate. But even, you know, if you're middle management or, or rank and file, everybody who is in uh, an employment setting has a responsibility to lead from the front on, on this issue in particular. Um, because when, it when you're talking about both race issues and, and sex, especially sex harassment, 
Um, these are the types of issues that everybody has, everybody who is working in a general area will be aware of, and they all have an opportunity to address them and try to drive them to an appropriate resolution so the behavior is ended in, in an appropriate manner, what, whatever that may be. But if you don't have effective leadership on this issue, and if people are afraid because they don't want to say something wrong, or they don't want somebody to call them some variety of an ist because they had the backbone to stand up and say, listen, this is our perspective on how we treat one another, and we're not going to tolerate any behavior that is disrespectful to our coworkers based on their race, their sex, whatever. And if you engage in that type of behavior, we're going to hold you to account. Um, and, and that may mean that you're not going to work for us anymore. If you don't have people who are willing to have a backbone and lead in that fashion, I don't think you are likely to have success in dealing with this issue. Conversely, if you have the backbone, the leadership with the backbone to deal with the issue, I think you can be successful. It doesn't mean you're gonna handle every scenario perfectly. It doesn't mean that everybody's always gonna agree with you, but the issue is not whether they agree with you. The issue is whether they respect you as a leader and are willing to follow you because they know you're gonna to try to do the right thing regardless of how difficult it is. And I, and I think you're exactly right for it. And, and, and those uh, core values of respect, the teamwork have not only gotta be stated, they have to be lived, right? If you're going to talk that talk, you got to be able to walk that walk. And part of walking that walk is making sure that you set clear expectations with consistent reinforcement. And here's what I tell folks all the time. And this maybe comes back to some of those invalidation of perspectives that we talk about, right? Anytime, particularly as a leader in the organization and as supervisors. And when I do supervisor training, Fred, I say this all the time. Inconsistency always looks like some form of discrimination or harassment, right? When we're not consistently enforcing those attendance rules and our promotion rules and our pay raise policies and procedures, and we're manipulating the system in some fashion, and, and hey, and it may be for a good reason. It may be, man, I'm about to lose this person, and so I'm going to do something that goes outside of our matrix, uh, or it may be that I really want to reward someone who's a great employee maybe has nothing to do with race or any other protected category, but that failure to be consistent ends up looking that way. And a lot of times that is the perspective uh, that individuals have. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to make sure that we set clear expectations and that we have clear policies and goals and that we consistently uh, reinforce those uh, policies, goals, uh, whatever objective measures we've set out there that we're actually treating people consistently. Yeah, that, that, that's just a, a, a no brainer. It's, it's really pretty much the only way you're going to succeed because you're not going to reach unanimous consensus on these issues. Again, it's just a matter of whether or not people will respect you enough as a leader to follow you, even when they disagree with you. And if they think that you're going to try to do the right thing, even if you don't get it right 100% of the time, and that you try to treat people fairly based on, again, the merits of their performance and not who they are, I think you can, you can be successful um, in, in this scenario. And Luther, let, let's, because you and I, you know, when we were talking the other day, we, we um, really had uh, some, some good back and forth on the issue of language. And the next slide, 18, talking about effective communication styles, including listening sort of segues on us into that general topic. But let's dive into that because I think at least hopefully for our listeners, I think that uh, they will find this to be pretty interesting. Yeah, and so one of the things that we've talked about uh, in, in language, uh, in their four bullets uh, that you'll see on the slide uh, about respecting individual styles, using common language, checking for meaning, uh, and not judging different speech negatively. I'll really go into this idea of how we talk to each other and how we communicate matters. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times, and Fred, I think it's probably been your experience too, that a poor choice of words, a poor choice of terminology uh, is almost as damaging, if not sometimes more damaging than whatever thought it is being expressed. Uh, and so we really got to pay attention to that. Sorry to cut you off, Luther, but let me give one example of that because this is something I use in training. In every manager training that, I'm do, that I do, I use this example about how not to 
how, how to communicate ineffectively, okay? And I use the example of, I, I'm, the, I'm the manager, and, and I have a group of employees working for me, and one of my employees is a 25-year-old black female. And if I think that that black female has a, quote, attitude, end quote, problem, and I say to her, I don't like your attitude, okay? The unanimous response that I've gotten, and I've done this example about 100 times, and I've had, every time I've had black females in the room, every single time they have agreed with me unanimously, no matter how much I like you, and no matter how much I respect you as my manager, if you tell me as a, a white male who's like 30 years older than me, that I have a bad attitude, inevitably I'm gonna take offense to that because it just, it just sort of in, inherently hits me the wrong way. And so my guidance is always say, I don't like your behavior. And then the response is 100% or you know, 180 degrees out different. People understand I, there's no racial context or animus associated with the word behavior, but with the word, historically speaking, the word attitude, absolutely, it's a loaded time bomb. So that's an, sorry to cut you off, but that's an example of what you're talking about in terms of language being, even if it's unintentional, it can really derail a conversation. Yeah, and, and, and you're exactly right. And, and feel free to cut me off because uh, we do that to each other all the time <laughs> when we're talking, especially when you've got a good nugget like that because people don't process that, right? Because, you know, one school of thought says, hey, if you have a bad attitude, I should just be able to say you have a bad attitude and you need to get over yourself on the receiving end. And part of the problem is, I think that's been our methodology for too long. And if we want to be leaders, right? It's the same thing I say uh, uh, with parenting, right? It matters how you approach the person on the receiving end. And if you know that there are terms that are going to be loaded and is going to be off-putting and you use them anyway and decide that it's that person's problem and not yours. And I've heard that many times. Well, this, you know, I'm going to say what I have to say. and They just need to address it. Well, nine times out of 10, you're going to get a negative reaction when you could have used better language and expressed the same thought and not ended up uh, in this negative space and creating racial tension or misunderstanding. Uh, and, and that's one of those concepts, uh, Fred, that you and I have talked about a lot, uh, you know, from a variety of perspectives. Uh, one of the things that, that, that you and I talked about before we uh, got on this program uh, was, you know, looking at it from the flip side, we get into these difficult conversations when we start talking about uh, concepts like white privilege uh, or the book that's floating around now uh, that has sometimes been used in training called white fragility, right? And so we get those terms where before we even start unpacking what we're talking about, folks are already put off by the phraseology and the terminology that we're using. Yeah, I want to jump into this one because I think this is really worthwhile discussion for our audience. And, and my basic proposition, you know, uh, and, and I've thought a lot about what, what you said last week, though. My, my basic proposition is that if I'm trying to convince people who are, you know, different from one another uh, in some form or fashion, which inevitably is what you have in a workplace, um, I, I want them to sort of rally around basic, simple concepts that they can understand and apply in virtually any circumstance. And that's why in one of the previous slides, you see those core values of respect and teamwork. Because it's very easy to look at. Somebody doesn't come to work on time, right? They're not being respectful to, to their teammates. If they do a crappy job, they're not being respectful to their teammates. If they behave like a jackass, they're not being respectful to their teammates. And so in any circumstance, that concept of respect sort of squares with, with almost any circumstance where you can put it into a box and everybody can look at it and almost intuitively understand, yes, I get it. This person's behavior, their performance, their, their uh, attendance is not aligning with that expectation of respect. And the same with teamwork. If something doesn't facilitate positive teamwork, it's a negative and it needs to be dealt with. And my reaction is that in talking about the issue of race, that when you use and, and drive your analysis around sort of the, the North Stars of respect and teamwork, I think that pretty much everybody can get on board. But the flip side is that when people start using terms like white privilege, white supremacy, white fragility, um, I, I, think that that, I think that that is off-putting and I think it has a significant propensity to derail 
conversations. But you've had some, worked with some groups where you felt like using that terminology was, was very effective. So, so have at it. Let the audience hear you on this. Yeah. And so what, what I said, a friend and I had a great conversation and back and forth on this because we, we, we disagree uh, about this, but probably not profoundly. Uh, but there are situations where I think that conversation is going to be appropriate. One of the things that I say to my employers all the time is this is not a one size fits all. So I'm going to look in your organization. And then if I'm coming in to do some training, for example, if these concepts are being manifested in the way uh, that uh, the organization is being led, uh, then it becomes appropriate to have that sort of conversation. Uh, but I can tell you, that if I'm in, for example, I, and I spent a lot of times in um, uh, a manufacturing environment in the Midwest, that's not a concept that's going to resonate. It's not anything that we're going to be able to talk about. But if I'm talking, Fred, uh, to uh, a law firm uh, that has no uh, African-American or Hispanic uh, employees or Asian employees as attorneys, and they haven't for uh, the past 50 years, then the language that I'm gonna talk about and what I may use to express what they're doing may start to fall into some of those categories. Uh, and that inability to have that conversation, it might be appropriate to talk about a concept like white fragility uh, or uh, white privilege in that type of environment. The mistake that I see people make uh, is they try to use these terms sort of generically and it doesn't resonate in a population of folks that haven't experienced that and may not even be able uh, to get past the labels that you're using. Uh, and so part of this conversation has to be knowing your workforce, uh, knowing what the issues are, and knowing whether it is intentional conduct, uh, unintentional conduct, a lack of awareness, or an unwillingness to address those issues. And I will submit to you that those are going to be, I like what you said about those guiding stars. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what the issues are. Uh, and then if my rhetoric needs to be ratcheted up uh, or if my cr conversation or criticism needs to be harsher, I'll do that. But I will submit to you that most of the time, that's probably not the right way to go. But there are times when that is appropriate. Uh, and, and I've certainly had those conversations when organizations need to be taken out to the woodshed uh, because their practices uh, were ridiculously discriminatory uh, and purposefully so. Let me, two, two points on this one. Um, the first point is, and so I hear what you're saying, and I, I understand philosophically what you're trying to accomplish. And, and clearly, if you think the time and place are right and that people will be able to listen to you talk about that issue and not be immediately defensive about it, I, I hear what you're, I hear you. But, and again, this is not so much a point for you, but for our audience, if you are going to venture into those waters, you, you cannot do so unless you are 125% prepared for somebody to stand up and say, listen, I philosophically, let's take this whole white fragility argument, okay? But I philosophically disagree with the notion of white fragility and, and that it makes any sense. And oh, by the way, since I have some understanding of the Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, my understanding is that the law is driving us away from evaluating people based on who they are as a group, and is intended to drive them towards an analysis of employees based on who they are as an employee, based on their attendance, performance, behavior, et cetera. And when you throw terms around like white fragility, what you're doing is inevitably creating us and them. The black employees, the white employees, the old employees, the young employees, the male employees, the female employees. And that, that undercuts you know, what we've been trying to accomplish since 1964 when, when that law went into effect. And oh, by the way, how, how is it that you can sit there and say that every black employee is similar you know, such that you can label them however you label them, and every white employee is similar such that you can say they all have white privilege, they're all part of white supremacy, they all have white fragility. Because if you're not prepared and haven't thought about how you're going to deal with such objections, um, you're going to get crushed and you're going to be embarrassed. So that, so that was my first point. And you hold off on before you respond to that. But my second point was, I would like you, Luther, to explain the scenario with the bathrooms. Uh, and I don't want to spoil it for you because I think that 
that scenario drives home the point you were just trying to make as to when that woodshed type of conversation. So you take those in however, whatever order you please. Yeah, no, so no, your, your first point is an excellent one. My frustration is uh, people have conversations about those concepts uh, and they're not prepared uh, for what you just uh, uh, said, for it, or, or they're not capable of having an appropriate conversation about those concepts. Uh, and I always advise folks, unless you're somebody who trains in this space, yeah, I, I get out of the business of trying to address those issues. And this is what I tell my clients all the time. We'll leave that to the folks who do this for a living, because otherwise you are going to get a tremendous backlash. Now, those situations where I take a client out to, uh, uh, to the woodshed, and I wish I was making this up, but it's a true story. Uh, I had a client where I was called in uh, to do some anti-harassment training, and they had segregated bathrooms, racially segregated bathrooms, uh, until about 1993. And that was one of those situations where I probably ratcheted up my rhetoric a little bit because that was very intentional. Uh, it was very purposeful and it was shameful. And I told them so in the presentation that I can't believe any employee of this organization uh, allowed that to go on until the 1990s. Uh, and we had probably a deeper dive into these concepts about privilege and fragility and intentional uh, discrimination, uh, and even to the, the African American employees there, I took them out to the woodshed as well because I'm like, I can't believe that you guys let this go on without saying anything about it. So what I certainly encountered those situations. What was their excuse? Tell them the excuse because this is this, <laughs> their, too, their their excuse I see it was, all the time. The excuse was there were only out of a couple of hundred of folks, there were only probably like nine or 10 African American guys. And they were like, we had our own bathroom. <laughs> and so it was, we didn't have to share it with everybody else. And, and I'm like, you know, that's ridiculous uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but so sometimes those conversations where you know that there are some policies or practices that are much more intentional, uh, I think you do ratchet up the conversation. Uh, when you know that it's not a function of a lack of awareness or that you have, you know, otherwise good intentioned people. Uh, in those situations where folks have had restrictive racial practices, where leaders have said stuff like, you know, we're not going to hire black folks because they're not qualified or, you know, we got one or two, that's enough. Uh, then we probably are going to ratchet up the conversation and get into some of those concepts. Let me take you down a different path, Luther. Um, we got about 10 minutes left. And I want to I, I want to get this one on the table because I know it's a constant issue. And people have heard me speak on, on, on the issue of race before have heard me say inevitably, in my 28 years of practice in every race case that I've ever dealt with, especially any harassment case, the N word has always been alleged to have been used and many times was used. So that type of racially uh, charged language, you know, there's the whole debate we have now. Okay, if you're white, you can't use it. If you're black, well, there's some historical uh, excuse and connotation as to why you can use it. And I, I want to focus our discussion only on the workplace because, quite frankly, I don't care what people do outside of work. But at, in the workplace, let, let's talk about that issue a little bit because I think our, um, especially with this election insanity just around the corner, and all of the language issues that go are associated with it. This one particular issue and the use of the N-word and related racially derogatory language is one we're gonna see a lot of. And I think our attendees here need to be, at least have some guidance on how to grapple with this issue. Yeah, I mean, I train to the standard that nobody uses that language in the workplace, uh, just like the B word, right? You could make the intellectual argument that if women are joking and bantering back and forth with each other, they ought to be able to do that. Some folks have made the argument that if African Americans are joking and bantering back and forth with each other in the workplace and they uh, uh, use uh, the N word that it's okay. I always train to the standard that it's never okay. And, and just like you said, Fred, whatever you do at your house, we can debate whether or not you should ever do it. Uh, but that's not my issue in this context. It is, that's not gonna happen at work. And even if you're saying, hey, I was talking to somebody that wasn't offended by it. Once I get that report that you've used the, that kind of language, regardless of the context, it becomes a disciplinary offense. 
Uh, and again, it's one of those situations where I've seen workplaces and supervisors turn a blind eye to that because they're like, well, you know, that's just how those guys talk. And they were talking to each other. And I'm like, no, we got to set our expectations and make them clear that that type of language is never, ever going to be permitted, even in joking, even if you're playing some music uh, that's not the radio edit, that language, that word in particular, and similar slurs are never permitted for any reason in our workplace. And I don't care who says it, uh, doesn't matter. It's not permitted. And I think that has to be the standard in the workplace. Uh, right. Otherwise, and you, we get into problems. In your example, you 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 mentioned that oh that the person to whom the language was directed, they were laughing and they they weren't offended. They weren't offended until they got disciplined. They didn't get a promotion. Or they got fired. And then it's, it's you know the primary allegations in their EEOC charge is is that they're using that language, white, black, or otherwise. The supervisor and management team w was aware of it, and they they were laughing about it and didn't do anything about it. I mean, exactly. it's, it's, it's a no-win scenario for an employer to allow any language towards, you know, if it's racially or sexually charged like that, it's a, it's a no-brainer. You're going to lose if you allow it to be used in the workplace. Yeah. I just think that, that's a, it's pretty simple. It's got to be one standard, and it has to be consistently enforced uh, because you set yourself up for that scenario. Well, you let this group use this type of language, and now it's an issue when I use it as a member of another group. That's why it's got to be that same standard, uh, and it's got to be consistently enforced to have any meaning. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I've had that case in, in every imaginable fashion, from the N-word uh, to Jewish slurs uh, amongst Jewish employees uh, to uh, Middle Eastern employees who were making uh, jokes about terrorism, you know, within the community and laughing. It's like, nope. Nobody's using that. I don't care if you were talking within your community uh, or to somebody uh, who was not offended. I'm not going to tolerate it. And that has to be our standard. Yeah, you can't manage to two standards, right? You, you can only have one. Absolutely. Because the second you create, and that's kind of why I went when I was talking about that issue earlier about certain terminology, it's like you create us versus them. So for you're almost inviting somebody to say we should have different standards for each group because that's what's socially acceptable right now. It's like, no, that, that's the whole point of Title VII to begin with. We don't want to have different standards. We want to have one standard, right? What are you, do, what are you, on, you on your face as an applicant or employee? Can you do the job the way it needs to be done? Can you behave appropriately? Can you come to work when you're supposed to come to work? That's the analysis. Okay, um, we got just a couple minutes left. So uh, let's segue to sli uh, slide 23, Luther, if you don't mind. And I think on this first point about, you know, this whole issue of, of social justice issues versus work-related, we've touched on it already, but I just wanted to reinforce the idea that, you know, there are going to be a lot of employees who, who have, you know, strong political feelings, especially in the next couple of months, you know, stemming from the George, George Floyd scenario into this, you know, parlaying into the election. And, and the deal is, is that, that's great outside of work as long as they're not doing things that outside of work, you know, that identify you as the company and or uh, are, you know, violating harassment, discrimination, uh, behavioral type policies with respect to co-employees, especially on social media who might be following them. We, we want to focus on, on work and work only when we're dealing with this issue because otherwise it's too complex. It's too divisive, and, and we have no business as employers really trying to, you know, uh, regulate how people feel about these issues outside of work. Yeah, and then the other thing that's becoming the bane of my existence, Fred, and I'm sure uh, this <laughs> is happening with you, you know, is, is what's going on on social media, right? Yes. And we've got to help our employees understand uh, that, and, and I say this all the time jokingly, uh -huh. Social media is not a special place. It's just another place where you can say stupid stuff that gets you in trouble at work. Uh, and our employees have to understand that if they are interacting with their coworkers or other constituencies that they come into contact with as a result of their job, and they've identified themselves as being employed by us in their profile, and we get a complaint about their comments, what was said on social media becomes fair game. Uh, and our employees have to understand that. And if their comments, uh, things that they share uh, from uh, other sources on social media uh, violate our company policies, 
uh, then it leads to discipline, particularly in this space uh, with the back and forth about uh, Confederacy and, and monuments and Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all of that stuff back and forth. You got to govern yourselves by the workplace rules if you are interacting with your workplace constituents, vendors, customers, clients, coworkers. Uh, and if you've identified yourself uh, as a member of our organization, particularly if you have some sort of leadership role. Uh, and, and I see employees not understanding this, right? Social media, because you made a post at 11 o'clock at night when you weren't at work, doesn't mean that that post doesn't potentially have implications for you in the workplace. And we got to help our employees understand that. I've had more managers struggle with this issue um, because they th think that, that they have this right to talk about politics um, and then they don't realize they have employees that are following them, which is the worst idea in the history of, you know, ideas in terms of social media. Yeah. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, they got the employees reporting to them, printing out, you know, their, their crazy, you know, pro-Trump comments and disseminating in the workplace. It, it's, it creates total, total chaos. All right, All right, and if, and if I have to explain to another employee that the First Amendment protects you from being arrested for your comments, but doesn't guarantee you that you're still gonna have this gig. <laughs> right? I've said this, like, what about my First Amendment rights? Hey, you're not being arrested. But the First Amendment says nothing about you continuing to work here when you've treated people like garbage and misrepresented our core values as an individual. Uh, Even off work. Folks understand that. Even outside of work. Even when they're outside of work. That's right. All right. Uh, one or two points on slide 25, and then we'll, we'll, we'll stop. But for me, uh, of, the, of the three points on uh, slide 25, the one that I really wanted to focus on was C. And it, lots of employees are going to come to you and talk to you about, you know, I have rights, you know, uh, et cetera. And my response is that you should encourage, but yes, you do have rights. And we want you to fairly and appropriately in this workplace. But the flip side is, is that I don't care how long you've been here whether you've been here forever or you've been here for 30 days, you have a responsibility to live up to the ex expectations and the goals and that we have set, especially in terms of being respectful. That means if you see something you don't like, you'll see something, say something, it's on you to report it. If you see somebody you know, who acts like a jackass, then you should say something to them if you feel comfortable and tell them it's not appropriate. But, but if you put that burden on people to you know, accept responsibility, I think it helps drive the conversation forward in a more meaningful manner because when employees believe that they're empowered to control the terms of their work, terms and conditions of their workplace, you end up with a better result in my view. Yeah, and I think that's a great place to, to end our comments. All right, Chris and Brian, you guys got anything else that you wanna chime in on? No, I think it's been a, a great conversation. You covered a lot of ground and I think on a, on a easily understood level that people can take back to their workplaces and go, oh, I think I see what you mean here and start implementing better practices that will make for a better work environment. That's, and that's what this is intended to do. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions and uh, we'll open up the portal for that. But I want to thank you both for, for taking the time out of your busy day to further educate. We'll get this video out to each of you and to our audience, those especially who weren't able to join us, even though they had registered. And of course, we've been uh, streaming on YouTube and I think Facebook as well. So hopefully get a larger audience on this. And I just want to thank you both for, for being committed to discussing race in the workplace in a far more productive manner. I think it's going to help everybody. Final thoughts? Luther, I'll uh, let you start. You want to go ahead, Fred? All right, I'll go ahead. I, I just encourage you, have some courage. Don't be afraid to address the issue. It's not going to be perfect. Just do the best you can, but think, in, think before you speak. And sometimes you're going to have to look in the mirror and realize you're not right on every issue. You're going to have to be willing to admit you're not right and make changes going forward. Yeah, and I'll direct your attention to, I think, the second to last slide, if you're looking at our slides, because this concept of being intentional uh, in your actions, right, what what I want to emphasize to folks more than anything else uh, is our inability to talk about uh, race uh, along with other societal ills is something that we have to confront and we got to be intentional about it. We can't just throw our hands up and say it's difficult. We've got to treat this like any other workplace uh, issue and hurdle that we need to get over. Uh, 
And the sooner we start doing that, the better off we're all going to be. It's a great wrap up there. And I want to end with where we started. Luther and Fred were able to have this conversation amongst themselves because they had a relationship first before they had this, this conversation. And I think Luther, your point about you can't have this conversation if you don't have that relationship. It's not going to go well. People are going to be very tense. So I think it's important, especially in the workplace, for people to start having those relationships and develop those uh, friendships, if you will, or just even have the conversations. And it's incumbent upon employers to develop the positive framework for which those can occur. And, uh, and then it can go to a very, a very productive and along the race uh, discussion. <laughs>